In the previous video, I gave examples of different ways that somebody's privacy might be violated. Peeping, snooping, making copies of your etchings, taking photos of you without your awareness or consent, government surveillance, and so on. But what is it that all these have in common? That is, why do we group them together under the heading of privacy? Is privacy just the state we're in when none of this particular ragtag collection of harms happen to be occurring in the moment? And if so, what is it that they all have in common that separates them from other types of harms? I mean, privacy isn't about just any harm. If I go to the pub, randomly insult some guy, and then he beats the living snot out of me, that might be some immense physical and perhaps also reputational harm for me, but my privacy certainly isn't being harmed. So what is it that's unique about privacy in particular? Well, that's what this video is all about. Because as it turns out, and as we noticed already back in the previous video, not least in relation to the conceptual confusion of the US Supreme Court, this simple question is very, very difficult to answer for various reasons. What reasons? Well, mostly about how words or concepts actually work. So today, let's talk about the concept of privacy. Now, a concept gets meaning by referring to some things and not others. But the very important and also much more complicated follow-up question is just this. Who decides exactly what privacy does and does not refer to, and how do these decisions get made? Before I start answering this question, however, I sense that there's a more fundamental question that might already have crossed your mind. And that is, quite simply, who cares? I mean, sure, we can sit and argue about the exact meaning of some concept back and forth all day long, but in the end, who cares? Won't we all just eventually default to using our concepts the way we've always been using them in our lives so far anyway? Well, I'm so glad you asked, because for one, you care. In fact, you care a lot. You might not realize it, but you most certainly do. Now, I'm not saying you care a lot about every single concept. Maybe it makes no difference to you whether this counts as a chair or not, or this. Honestly, the concept of chair just isn't all that exciting or important to most of us. Okay, so not all concepts are as relevant, and we certainly don't care deeply about all of them. But privacy? Oh, you really care about that. It's a strongly emotionally loaded concept, and you, like basically everybody else in the world, already assume that you have some sort of right to it. So, therefore, you care. Not convinced? Let me give you a few examples. Let's say you're a teenage boy in high school and you play soccer. Your team is playing a game and your friends and family are all there, as well as the local press. As it happens, however, the photographer for the local newspaper takes a photo of you running after the soccer ball right when your testicles and penis happen to be showing through your shorts leg from that specific angle. The newspaper publishes the photo to accompany their write-up of the game the next day, and you are mortified. You and your parents take the paper to court to sue for invasion of your privacy, as any reasonable person would. I mean, how could they? Well, after the case makes its way through the legal system, eventually the court decides that at the time the photograph was taken, you were voluntarily participating in a spectator sport at a public place. The court therefore holds that because the published photograph accurately depicts a public newsworthy event, the right to freedom of the press provides the newspaper with immunity from liability for damages resulting from its publication of the photograph. In other words, because it all happened in public and because the newspaper didn't publish anything misleading or untrue about you, you're out of luck. Basically, it happened in public, so it can't have been private in the first place. Now, I don't know about you, but if this were me, I'd be furious at this outcome. And more specifically, my anger would be directed at the court's concept of privacy, for failing to protect what I would assume I ought to have a right to, that is, not having a photo of my genitalia published in the local press. In other words, I would care deeply about the specific concept of privacy that says that just because something happens in public, it can't be private in any way whatsoever. That is a concept that I would want to change. Still not convinced? Okay, how about revenge porn? This is where a person, usually a man, posts explicit photos or videos of their ex, usually a woman, online without their consent. So basically, the sorts of private photos that people might send to each other when they're in the throes of early love are later weaponized to get back at an ex for breaking up with you in the most cravenly disrespectful and disempowering way possible. One of the original websites to engage in this was isanyoneup.com, which not only posted revenge porn images, but also included links to the individual's name, address, social media profiles, and so on. This led to huge problems for many of the people unwittingly featured on the site, with their relationships, losing their jobs, committing suicide, and so on. 
The site was eventually taken down, but, and this is the crucial point, it was taken down not because revenge porn was in and of itself illegal in the U.S. at the time, but because it turned out that the owner of the site had hacked several victims' email and social media accounts to access their private photos. In other words, it was the hacking, not the posting of the explicit images, that got the owner into legal trouble. Imagine that. You took a nude selfie, sent it to your partner when you were just dating in the beginning. A few years down the road, you break up, and the selfie then winds up on the internet, together with your name, your address, your social media profile, and so on. Hundreds of strangers discuss you and your body in crass and insulting terms, and send you emails and private messages ranging from come-ons to actual threats of rape or murder. And your government just sort of shrugs and says, well, sorry, but unless your account was hacked, that's not legally an invasion of privacy, so there's nothing we can do about it. You probably shouldn't have taken a nude selfie in the first place. Does that feel like a concept of privacy you would want or be satisfied with? Let's uh, try a little experiment. Hands up everybody who's ever taken a nude or semi-nude selfie. Right, so almost every adult under the age of 50, and a lot of those over 50 as well. Okay, hands up if you've ever sent any such selfie to anybody else. All right, not quite as many, but still the vast majority of you. Okay, last question. Hands up, everybody who would want that image widely plastered all over the internet, discussed and commented on by strangers, and sent to your family, friends, boss, etc. Nobody? Yeah, that's what I thought. So yeah, you care. You care about the concept of privacy a lot. Or, for many of you, you may be lucky enough that none of this sort of thing has happened to you or anybody close to you yet, but as soon as it does, you will be deeply concerned about how privacy, at least as a legal concept, is defined, and therefore what does and does not count as part of the concept. All right, so what have we established so far? Well, we've established that the concept of privacy is a bit unclear and that we need to sort out what it actually means. We do this by specifying what does and does not count as privacy. We still haven't discussed how to decide this or who decides it, but we have established that it matters a lot. Why? Well, because how we define the concept makes a real and concrete difference for whether or not we get the help and protection we feel we deserve if or when our own privacy is violated. Okay, so far so good. Now back to that earlier question. Who decides? Who decides how we ought to define privacy? Well, there are two basic answers to this. Either someone decides, a person, an organization, some specific profession or similar, or everyone decides through some sort of democratic-ish process, like perhaps in the way we all just naturally use language to make ourselves understood to others. I'm now going to break each of these down a little in order to highlight how, no matter which option we choose, it's going to involve some rather sticky compromises that we might not be willing to make. So let's start first with the idea that someone, a person, an organization, some specific profession or similar, gets to decide what privacy really means. Now, if we want to get technical, and of course we do, then this is what's known as a prescriptive definition. In other words, that someone prescribes how a concept ought to be understood, whether or not people are actually using it in that way in their daily lives. So, for instance, here's a suggestion a lot of people make and that I sort of hinted at when I discussed revenge porn just a moment ago. And that's the suggestion that we should let the law decide what privacy means. After all, legislators and lawyers already spend oceans of time working on precisely these sorts of conceptual things, so why not let them determine in a prescriptive manner? Boom! Job done, right? Well, we could do that if we really wanted to, but we already know this would be pretty worthless in many cases, like revenge porn up until recently, or K.V. Robertson, which we discussed in the previous video. But why? Why might all this high-level conceptual work by legal scholars and courts and so on fail to reach a prescriptive concept that we all might be happy with? Well, as we discussed before, the law is always a bit behind the latest developments in the way that it tries to track the major concerns of the people in a society. But the law also needs to be kept reasonably coherent and consistent with itself. This means that sometimes we've based entire bodies of the law on some old law, which although it's no longer really relevant, we also can't easily remove it because then that entire area of law would collapse in on itself. For example, a lot of privacy law in the United States today is still to some extent dictated by legislation that was developed to protect the records of which VHS cassettes you rented from your local blockbuster. I think it's pretty safe to say that not so many of us are watching rented videos on VCRs anymore. 
And given all the technical innovation that's happened since those days, it should be easy enough to understand how relying on old legal concepts entails a risk that you'll be out of date with the real world. In fact, although there is now today some legal protection in the US against revenge porn, it came only after the phenomenon itself had been around for more than 10 years. So the law can be outdated both in the sense of relying on irrelevant legal concepts from the past or from simply not having caught up with the most recent developments. On top of that, even if a legal concept of something isn't out of date, it might still be flat out wrong. For instance, it used to be illegal in many states in the US for white and non-white people to marry or have sex with each other until the Supreme Court finally ruled this to be unconstitutional in 1967 in the case of Loving v. Virginia. So yeah, legal concepts like the concept of marriage before 1967 can be not only out of date but also just morally wrong. What about privacy specifically? Are there similar examples there? Well, apart from the revenge porn example we've already discussed, how about the recent 2019 case of Herrick v. Grinder? This case involved a situation that arose between the plaintiff, Herrick, and an unhappy ex of his. His ex went on to the hookup app Grinder to create numerous fake profiles of Herrick with information about him including his real address and stating that he was available for sex and had illegal drugs to sell. Because of the fake profiles, more than a thousand men came to Herrick's house for sex or drugs or both, and he was, understandably, quite fearful for his personal safety. He therefore sent numerous requests to Grinder to delete the fake profiles, and when they didn't do that, he sued them. The result? Well, under what's known as Section 230 of the United States Communications Decency Act of 1996, the court found that Grindr was immune from any liability because they're just a platform for individuals to publish information. In other words, legally speaking, the fact that Grindr created a platform where Herrick's personal details could be published in a way that seriously and repeatedly threatened him was, it turns out, not a privacy issue. Now, I don't know if this is as wrong as some of the racist state laws from last century, but I'm quite certain that our kids and grandkids will look back on these sorts of cases with the same sort of disbelief. As regards privacy, in many respects, we still sometimes seem to be living in the Middle Ages. Uh, a very brief aside, to all of you who aren't Americans, I hear you. This stuff I'm talking about probably all sounds like a uniquely American problem, but how relevant is it in other countries like Sweden? Don't Swedes have very good privacy protections? Or feel free to replace Sweden with whatever other country you prefer. Now, I'll have more to say in the later videos in the series about the way the European Union countries approach privacy, in particular through the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. But this doesn't take away from two important facts, which I mentioned already in the previous video. First, the conceptual debate on privacy has, for decades, been very much led by specifically American scholars. And second, since all the big tech companies are American and so much of privacy today is about what happens to our information when it's stored and processed in gigantic server farms, then the fact that this storage and processing tends to occur on American American soil still makes a big difference. So yes, there are nuances, but the focus on American law, whether we like it or not, is relevant to all of us, no matter where in the world we happen to be. Okay, so legislators and lawyers might not be the best someone to define a prescriptive concept of privacy for us. The law tends to develop reactively at quite a slow pace, and so it's usually more of a minimally decent protection of our shared societal values. And like with revenge porn, yes, eventually it'll tend to catch up. But it's always running behind the most recent developments, and sometimes also behind what our society actually considers right and wrong. So we need some other definition of privacy if we want to be able to criticize or prove whatever legal definitions we happen to be stuck with right now. Now, where else might we find a good prescriptive definition of privacy? Well, we could ask the companies whose areas touch on privacy in some form or other. So, for example, tech companies like Alphabet, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, OpenAI, Tesla, TikTok, or Twitter. Um, I mean X. Perhaps they have some good prescriptive definitions. Well, as it turns out, unfortunately not. I mean, they have plenty of self-serving definitions that facilitate their business models and bottom lines, absolutely. But good, solid, prescriptive definitions that actually chime with how you and I as individuals feel about our personal privacy? Not really. Or, well, 
sometimes the tech sector does present some good definitions, but generally they don't come up with these themselves. Either they're just the same old legal definitions we've already discussed, or else they're based on the work of philosophers focusing on privacy. Aha! So then maybe philosophers can provide us with a nice strong prescriptive definition of privacy, one that really captures the essence of what you and I mean by it when we want to be protected from revenge porn and so on. Because that's what philosophers do, right? Figure out what concepts mean and how they work and so on. Well, that last part is kind of true, and as a matter of fact a number of philosophers have been more than happy to try to give a solid definition of privacy their best shot. Unfortunately, however, being philosophers they tend not to agree with each other about the proper definition at all. If anything, I'd argue that they disagree even more than the different legal definitions of privacy from different countries do. So sadly, if we turn to philosophers of privacy, we could choose any of a number of different competing definitions of the concept, but we sure won't find any consensus. So as regards the prescriptive side of things, it seems we're more or less out of luck. But perhaps the answer was staring us in the face all along. Perhaps we should approach this not on the basis of what some particular one person or organization or profession might tell us is the proper definition of privacy, but what we all, everyone, understand by it. After all, that would also do a nice job of keeping our concept of privacy fresh and up to date. As society changes and people's views of privacy evolve, so too would our descriptive concept of it. Nice, right? Actually, this pivot from prescriptive to descriptive kind of represents how dictionaries have evolved over the years. In the past, dictionaries were mostly prescriptive, that is, their researchers and compilers and editors told all of us how language ought to be used, they prescribed proper use of the language. In other words, more of the grammar Nazi approach. This is the correct meaning and usage of this word, and even if you and 40 million other people disagree and use it differently, you're all wrong. To which people responded, that ain't no good. To which the grammar Nazis responded, it's actually, that isn't any good. To which the people responded, like, you know, for real, you should have just let it go, bro. To which the grammar Nazis, or at least the ones working on dictionaries, eventually gave up and decided to adopt a different approach. And so today, most dictionaries, at least in English, are not prescriptive so much as descriptive. That is, they don't try to tell us how we're supposed to use our language, instead they try to describe how we actually use it. Which is why nowadays, unlike in the past, you can find swear words in dictionaries, as well as some slang and dialect words and so on. So less grammar Nazis and more like grammar crowdsourcing. All right, let's try it out. Let's say we open our dictionary to find a recent crowdsourced descriptive definition as follows. Privacy, noun. 1. A condition characterized by seclusion from others. 2. A condition characterized by being free from public attention or unwarranted intrusion. So by this definition we have privacy if we're alone, if others aren't paying attention to us, and if we're not suffering from some sort of intrusion that can't be legally justified. All right, well, this tracks common intuitions reasonably well. It covers several of the examples I've already discussed. Peeping is definitely an unwarranted intrusion. Government or big tech surveillance also arguably fits under the same heading, although this does depend a bit on how we define unwarranted. Keeping your royal etchings to yourself is definitely an example of being free from public attention, so that stands. But what about something like keeping embarrassing secrets hidden from my parents or siblings in my diary? Perhaps this can be filed under unwarranted intrusion, especially if the parent or sibling has been snooping around with the specific intention of reading my diary despite knowing it might hurt my feelings. But what if I forget that I left it lying around in the living room, they don't know what it is, and they start flicking through it without any thought that it might be my private diary? This doesn't really feel like an unwarranted intrusion. And given that they're parents or siblings, I don't think it qualifies as public attention either. And it doesn't really fit under seclusion from others. After all, the harm in this case isn't that they're near me or near my possessions. No, the harm is that they gain information about me that I don't want them to have because it's embarrassing. Okay. Hold on a minute. Maybe I'm asking too much of the dictionary's definition of privacy. Maybe it's actually perfectly fine, and the problem here is with the case I'm using, the accidental diary reading. Maybe this isn't a good case of privacy, and most people agree that it shouldn't be included in a good definition of the concept. Perhaps when I argue that it is about privacy, I'm just being ridiculous, like somebody saying, don't look at my ears, they're private. 
Now, as you may already have guessed, this is the first problem of descriptive definitions. How on earth do we decide which views count as being sufficiently relevant or sufficiently popular or whatever other criteria we want to use to allow them to be included in our crowdsourced descriptive concept? After all, different people might mean different things when they talk about a concept like privacy, and therefore they might also have very different intuitions about what does and does not count as privacy. So our descriptive definition can't just be about polling everybody and trying to come up with some sort of universally acceptable solution since we won't all be able to agree, especially when it comes to concepts like privacy that are so emotionally loaded. But, I hear you thinking, haven't the dictionaries already solved this? They do research. They read books and newspaper articles and watch TV shows and figure out that way when a new meaning is popular enough to be included in their definition of a word. Like when enough of us use on fire to mean something positive instead of meaning that it's actually burning. Well, then on fire gets a new dictionary definition added to it. The problem? Well, Nobody, not even the Oxford English Dictionary, has the resources to keep track of all books and newspaper articles and TV shows and YouTube videos and whatever else they want to include in their research. So whichever sources they do choose to work with, like, say, TV news reports instead of reality TV dating shows, this will bias their view of what our language is actually like. Because in the end, nobody has access to all the many different colorful ways that any one language is actually used. And we see this in that, for a concept like privacy, every single dictionary seems to have a different definition of it. So it's basically as bad as the philosophers, no consensus anywhere. So much for crowdsourcing. Okay, but let's try to save this one last way, with the internet to the rescue. Maybe instead of relying on researchers and editors and other gatekeepers, we should just turn our descriptive definitions completely over to the hands of the general population in an exercise of pure democracy in its most basic sense. Let everybody weigh in, and then we'll get something approximating a universal shared descriptive definition, right? Well, as a matter of fact, we do have projects like this, like UrbanDictionary.com, where anybody can submit their own definition of any concept. Great idea, but the unfortunate reality is that it's an incoherent mess for anybody trying to gain any sort of actual conceptual clarity. Not only is it limited to those who are aware of and interested in contributing to its continued existence, which we can pretty safely assume is mostly youngish males with below average social skills, but it's also morphed over time into something of a comedy site. For example, one of the recent suggested definitions of privacy on the site is something that Mark Zuckerberg has stolen from us years ago. Not exactly a definition that helps to protect us against potential privacy harms. So prescriptive definitions tend to be either self-serving, out of date, and possibly immoral or completely lacking any consensus. And the descriptive definitions instead tend to either suffer from various blind spots in how they assess actual language use, or they collapse into internet meme nonsense. Fortunately, however, there is a way forward. Instead of looking for the one true definition to rule them all, we should look at how the concept has developed over time. Like in the last video where we discussed how the legal concept of privacy has grown over time to encompass an increasing range of situations. This helps give us a general idea of what the term means in a legal context. But we also need to look a bit at the conceptual philosophical work that's been done on privacy. Now, this is an extremely technical area, but in a nutshell we can break this conceptual debate on privacy into two camps, which I already mentioned briefly last time. On the one hand, there are those scholars who very prescriptively argue that the Supreme Court expansion of privacy is wrong, and that privacy is really only ever about personal information and nothing else. They'll typically defend their definitions with a sort of dismissive shrug. You don't like my definition? Well, sucks to be you, get over it. Especially if they have good solid arguments to support that their limited definition really does solve some problems or provides a better way of approaching specific issues. Let's call this a narrow definition of privacy. And then, on the other side, there are those who believe privacy is the narrow version plus the extra Supreme Court stuff of privacy relating to the possibility of making important life decisions, such as whether to have a baby or not, and so on. On this view, then, essentially, privacy is whatever people think it is, so in other words, a much more descriptive view of the concept. Do people have incoherent views about privacy? No problem. We can just throw different incompatible definitions together, like in a dictionary, neatly separated by an or. 
So then privacy might be defined as being all about personal information or all about important life decisions or both. Let's call this a wide definition of privacy. An extreme and extremely influential example of this in academic research is probably legal scholar Daniel Solov's lucid 2006 article, A Taxonomy of Privacy, where he lists not two but 16 different ways in which privacy can be harmed. What is privacy in Solov's view? Well, as his article has it, any or all of the 16 options he presents. Now, I hope you all understand that I'm oversimplifying what is in reality a rather nuanced and complex debate, but I think that even if I'm oversimplifying, I'm still highlighting an important fundamental difference in how different philosophers and legal scholars think about concepts and their definitions. Either they're far more strict and limited, focused on developing a precise and coherent narrow definition of privacy, but at the risk that it winds up being too far removed from the way the term is actually used in society so as to render it largely irrelevant or they're far more flexible and permissive, with an attendant risk of developing a clumsy and possibly somewhat incoherent but very wide and open definition of privacy. And what's better? Honestly, who knows? A concept that's kept restricted in the face of other people's conflicting views risks becoming completely irrelevant, but a concept that balloons and expands too much can become too all-encompassing, thereby dissolving into some sort of vague meaninglessness. How do we solve this? Well, I wish I knew. Fortunately, though, I don't think we need to. I mean, we might be individually drawn more to narrow or to wide definitions, but I don't think we'll ever establish which one is ultimately better or more true because we don't know how we would ever properly assess something like that in any objective manner. On the other hand, this probably doesn't matter so much because we've already made significant progress on a number of other fronts which are really worth summarizing. First of all, the concept of privacy is hotly contested by many people, and this has real-life implications. For example, numerous legal cases find that privacy, on some specific legal definition, has not been threatened or harmed even if we might very much feel that it has, like K.V. Robertson. Understanding this, we can appreciate that influencing how definitions of privacy develop in philosophical and legal research can very much affect the lives of real people and so are worth taking seriously. One particularly noteworthy way in which this has played out relates to feminism. You see, everybody knows that we all sometimes want our privacy. Nobody wants to be the victim of revenge porn. But everybody also knows that sometimes privacy can be a bad thing. It might shield criminals and terrorists. And it has also, throughout history and up until quite recently, been used as a tool for subjugating women. So, as feminist scholars have very convincingly argued, things like marital rape and domestic violence and so on were long seen as private matters for families to deal with on their own without any involvement from police or courts or similar. Basically, because they were considered private family disputes, the authorities often didn't want to get involved. Hence the feminist 1970s slogan that the personal is political, and relatedly that the private is public. Fortunately, this push has led to increased attention to these phenomena, and authorities today tend to be much more likely to get involved, even if the extent to and manner in which they do so will still often leave a lot to be desired. But the point for our discussion here is just this. How we understand the concept of privacy, including what it should and should not rightly protect, has a very real impact on real flesh and blood people. Second, we can also appreciate that no matter which definition of privacy we're presented with, the historical thrust of the concept so far indicates that it will continue to change and develop over time, not least as new technologies are developed and launched into the world. In other words, the concept of privacy is always in some state of flux, and we probably won't ever be able to pin it down completely. Or even if we could somehow do that, the definition would only last for a short while before being superseded by new technological or societal developments that would require us to, again, go back and rethink it. One conceptual development in this respect that I think is particularly informative is the philosopher Helen Nissenbaum's argument from 2004 that the concepts of private and public are not simple opposites. So remember the example I started this video with about the teenage boy whose penis and testicles were briefly visible up his shorts leg while he was playing a soccer game and he just happened to be photographed at that very moment with the photo subsequently published in the local newspaper? That's actually a real case. And if you recall, the court's decision was that because the game happened in public, there could be no reason reasonable expectation of privacy and therefore no legal remedy. This sort of view is typical of many courts in many cases and basically arises from a concept of privacy that assumes that the moment something has been made or could be considered public, 
then it would be contradictory to consider it private any more in any sense at all. Basically, once the privacy cat's out of the bag, there's no putting it back in. But Nissenbaum, she argues that this isn't even close to being true in many cases, and then explains why in a way that's both conceptually precise and better at tracking common intuitions about these sorts of cases. So basically, in her work, she argues that what matters is not some overly simplistic public or private distinction, but rather what she calls the contextual integrity of information. Contextual integrity, on her view, refers to information being used in an appropriate context. So for example, it's appropriate for a doctor to learn certain very intimate details about, say, the state of your toileting in order to figure out why you've been having stomach pains, whereas your boss or colleagues learning the same information would very much not respect its contextual integrity. Basically, that's the wrong context for that sort of information, and so them finding out about it will harm your privacy. Likewise, and more important for the upcoming videos in the series, the fact that we might do certain things in public that everyone can see, like buy certain groceries at the store, doesn't thereby mean that the store has an unrestricted right to track all our grocery purchases in order to develop probing and intimate profiles of us as consumers. So when you take a bunch of what seems to be trivial and meaningless information, like individual grocery purchases, and where the cultural context also has us all assume that the information is in fact trivial and meaningless, and it's then secretly aggregated together into complex and revealing individual profile that can infer all sorts of extremely personal information, well, that would be the store not respecting the contextual integrity of your grocery purchase information and therefore harming your privacy. We'll get back to this when we talk about privacy and autonomy because it's awfully relevant for the way that social media works. A more recent argument in a similar sort of vein comes from the philosopher Carissa Velis, who points out that there are several cases where we have more of an expectation of privacy in the streets than we would in our own home. For example, if we're looking to have a private conversation with a close friend and confidant away from nosy neighbors and inquisitive family members, then we'll often head out into the noisy and chaotic streets to ensure that the conversation isn't overheard by anybody carefully listening in. Again, basically the traditional distinction between private and public breaks down. Both these arguments from Nissenbaum and Velis are perfect examples of how even without defining exactly what privacy is, we can still make progress on what it is not, in this case by overturning some simplistic interpretations of the concept. Third, we know that whatever definition of privacy we might be working with, it will always need to be balanced against other societal values and interests, like freedom of the press or the ability of a government to undertake reasonable criminal investigations. How far different various values and interests win out over the others obviously remains an open question, and may well vary a lot from one individual case to another. But that any proposed protection of privacy will typically need to be balanced against something else, that will always hold true regardless. And incidentally, I think this tracks what we might call the evolutionary origins of privacy. If we think about our ancient prehistory and the sorts of tribal hunter-gatherer groups that we humans lived in before the advent of large societies, then it's relatively easy to think about how privacy would be an important factor in group dynamics. Basically, if the tribe doesn't cooperate well enough, they die. So non-cooperative tribe members, like freeloaders or psychopaths, they would constitute an existential threat to the group. Therefore, there was a powerful need to keep tabs on each other to make sure that others were behaving in a way that didn't threaten group survival. This is, to a large extent, where we seem to get taboos and gossip from. They're the essential and original way of policing the behavior of others when there were no police or courts or authorities or similar. But group pressure can also be overbearing. We're all individuals and we all occasionally feel the need to be able to relax and be ourselves without fear of what others might say about our individual tics and quirks. And because this is a universal experience, something we all occasionally feel, it then makes sense that we develop a strong desire for privacy to counteract overly oppressive group demands. So basically, from the very beginning, it's extremely plausible to assume that privacy has existed to protect the personal needs of the individual, but that this has always has been limited and balanced against other needs, like the collective need to keep tabs on individual tribe members so that they don't become a threat to group survival. Privacy has never in any context been an absolute. Finally, although the lack of any ultimate authoritative definition of privacy might be seen as deeply dissatisfying, I don't actually think having a clear and universally agreed definition is at all necessary to make progress on various privacy issues in our own societies today. I could say a lot more about this, but I'll leave that for the following videos in this series. There we'll discuss, among other things, how privacy and data security intersect with each other and what the implications of this are. And then after that, we'll talk about the relationships between the two general components of the Supreme Court's 
definition, privacy and autonomy. And as we'll see there, I don't think we need precise definitions of either term in either case to make substantial progress on these issues. I'll see you in the next video.